this is half, all right? I split, I, I chainsawed this this morning. I split it. There was a crack in it, so I followed the crack. Um, okay, so I split that down with a fro. Um, and then I spent about, I don't know, five or six minutes, ten minutes, cutting, cutting this out. So this has just been done with a blocker in, I'll well, see what we can do, this way. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm getting one plane. So I'm trying to get that. I don't want it screwing around. I just want it one, one flat surface. And then you work off that. You go, okay, that's all level. I've got this card that I made up. Now, her foot isn't this shape, but with the best will in the world, you don't make shoes foot shape. You make shoes to be comfortable and to look nice. It's not the same as being the same shape as a foot. She's probably wider here, but when you put the foot in a curve, it becomes narrower in the toe box. So you don't follow it exactly. And you need to undercut here and here on shoes, on clogs, on anything. If you don't undercut there, you don't center the foot and then it will wobble around here and here. So you undercut it slightly and then you have to get the toe shape looking you know, how they want it. They might want a very broad toe. They might want a, what's called a duck toe, which is uh, almost like a, a duck beak, comes up to a point. This is slightly pointed common round. It's, it's pretty average. So looking at that, that's the shallow end. We'll do that. Now that's the other half. So I need, that needs to go that way because it's upside down at the moment. And what we do, if we just, draw around this pattern I so carefully made. Okay, I don't know if you can see that, but you've got a pattern on that. And then I'll hack into it with the blocker. So. When I, when I cut down, I tend to break the knife open by just twisting it there so I can get it out again. So, let me just cut along the back. It's fast, isn't it? Yeah, it, 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 it is fast, but it gets, uh, unless you do it all the time, it quickly gets slow, unfortunately, because you're going backwards and forwards. Uh, I've just got one type of last I use. I did have two. I saw one to a chap down in Kent that wanted to learn to do it. Um, I saw him a set of knives. He has made stuff, but he said he hasn't made them with, the, with these. He said it's too difficult. But basically, I've, I've got one curve imprinted on my brain. So, and on this one, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to roll it in a bit. It's not a straight line. I want a particular curve. So I'm looking across. Uh, 
And then uh, you cut the heel. I use a little silky, which is actually distributed just down the road at Mansell Lacey. But so you just... <laughs> Lovely little knife. Japanese, only cuts on the pull. So it's not very traditional, really. So you cut back into here. And it's, you have to make this curve slightly concave or straight. If you make it convex, it looks lumpen. See, that's a lump there, not, not good. So, that's better, that's better. Um, we've, we've ended, you, you tend to do it in a pair, so I take that one down to the same as this one. Um, and then when I've got them both, with the same roll, the curve starting in the same place, the arch and the step here the same, the heels roughly the same. You know, that, that, a mirror image, in fact. Then, then um, you can do a bit more. Not great because then knots just appeared. But um, it might disappear again. Depends how much we cut away. I'll leave it for now. No, yeah, a bit more is going to come off. So I'll just take a bit. You've got a lot of leverage here because it's the bit of the knife I'm using is right against a hook. So you're really not putting much force into it. The only thing it's bad on is the wrists. Because you're doing a lot of control with the wrists. And this is the other end, you see I've got less, less control now. That'll do. You take off, just trip a bit off here. The knives were made up north, so even the Welsh right out in the countryside tended to use this one. They made the other ones, but they used this one. They couldn't make anything as good as this. Um, and it's a laminate. So it's a raw iron handle and hook. And then it's scuffed over here, folded over, folded over here. And this is two piece. This is, uh, you can see here, it's uh, Henry Carter, High Burton. And you see the, the color difference. Now that's uh, high carbon steel and that's raw iron. And the problem is that that has quite a low melting point and that has quite a high melting point. So when you try and weld them together, you're at the extreme range of of the of what you can do they're just about managing to, to to meld with each other but and it's only it's about eighth of an inch it's only maybe a tenth thick and it just sits on the back but if you have the whole blade um, in high carbon it's brittle so you need you need a, a softer back piece to uh, provide strength really to make it more make it stronger. It's funny enough, the harder you get, the, the weaker it is to some extent. Henry Carter just made clog knives. Nobody else made any clog knives uh, uh, for this. This, this is uh, the blocker or stock knife. Uh, the, because of the misuse recently of the terms, uh, mainly by uh, the Pole Turners Association, uh, people keep re referring to the, all of them as stock knives, but that's not the case. This is a stock knife. The other ones are the hollower and the gripper bit. Um, 
but this is spe specifically just a clog knife. It's, it's not a general knife, it's not to make pegs, it's not to do any other carving work, it's a clog knife. And the, the handle is canted off at an angle, so it's not in line. And it's very fine, and the chamfer's on the back. And the reason the chamfer's on the back is so I can do this curve. If it's not on the back, I can't do a concave curve. This is a, a Mobs Miller Last. Uh, it's a 3689. It's, it's, it's imprinted on my hand somewhere because when I cut, I cut for this. So there it is, it's sit, sitting in. That's how I want it to sit. This is a 3B Mobs Miller. It's about the same as a four and a half shoe. This particular one has a little patch on the uh, inside because the last time I used it, I wanted to make the, the toe on the inside a bit fuller. Generally, these lasts are a little bit narrower than people need today. We're heavier bone than we were in the 20s. So, and this, this last again, it works quite well as a shoe last. Um, a lot of the clog lasts people, people use are boot lasts. And our boot is designed to hold round here. And it's deeper here. So when you make a clog to fit um, a person and use a boot last, as they nearly always do, people say, oh, we've got to wear several pairs of socks. It's because the, but the last is too deep. And it's not designed for a shoe. A shoe fits from there to there. That's how it fits. A boot fits around there. So the last isn't the same. So anyway, we've got last. This is the hollower. Now this, again, is in Wales, sometimes they're made in two pieces. Uh, now on the, the grip, uh, the stock knife, which you saw me use, it's very fine. Actually, you want it as fine as you can get it. You want quite a steep edge on the back. It's, I don't know, maybe 30 degrees, 25, 30. Well, that's, that other one's more like 15. Um, if you don't have that, it doesn't... If you don't have it, it doesn't sit on the back bevel. So when you go down here, it rocks and you get a series of ripples. That's cutting a nice straight line. Do you see? It's, I'm not getting any ripples, it's just going straight down. So I've got that. Now you can do the chamfer on the edge first or second. I've just chosen to do it with this first. I'll show you what the chamfer is in a minute. So we cut down here. Okay. Now the lasts come uh, bowed. That's better, it's sitting, beginning to sit in. They come bowed across here. Now, th the main weight of the foot is on this joint, just here. So I actually drop my soles, I don't copy this. I drop this here to make the lowest part of the, of the sole just there, or same level as that. Certainly not any higher, because you, if somebody's got a very pronounced joint, I, they, they've done a lot of barefoot walking, then this is really uncomfortable. So we're just, uh, we'll knock into here. And I like this curve here to be a straight line. A lot of the machine ones aren't, and it's just for ease of machining. So this is quite a curve here. But if you get it right, it can be a support for the arch, but it's more, I, I tend to do it more just for strength. So they're less likely to break. And then, yeah, that's not too bad. Now we've got a problem, because we're going one way, and then we're coming back this way again. So what do you do with the join? And what do I do about this? I use what's called in Wales a tooker cam. So that's a tooker cam, and this is what you do with it. It's very much like a spoon knife. You just clean out. Oh. 
this I, I just tend to use just to clean up. So we'll leave it at that for now, for that knife. The three knives, well, you've seen two work so far in this. And then we'll go back to um, doing the edge. We'll see it again, okay? So I'll just draw this line back on. It changes a bit because when you put the, it into a curve, it becomes narrow again. So you put the pattern on flat, you put the pattern on after you've done the curve, it's not the same shape. So I've, I've done the, the hollowing for the foot, it's roughly about right. Ledge is about right. Tend to leave it a little bit wide. If I really foul up, then I can add a little piece of leather in um, between the upper and the sole to make it a bit wider if I need to. It doesn't show in the final product and it doesn't make any difference how long it lasts. So I sometimes do that. So I don't always take the, the, the bevel right down tight. But you can, you can cut the bevel with this. But I tend to cut it. With a stock knife, I tend to prefer to do it with this. So basically, you're cutting in and you're feeling the knife. If it starts to bind, you know it's splitting. So I can feel it there. It's not cutting, it's splitting. So you feel it, and it doesn't, it depends on the wood you're working. You're going in, in, so it shouldn't split. But you're going up, so you're going away from the grain, so it could split. So you're never quite sure there whether you're gonna be able to run right through or you're gonna to have to come back. So anyway, just, Right round here, and then we shamp for this. And that's dangerously close. Uh, that's the reason why, because we've got a little knot in there. So it wanted to take the grain off in a different direction. So it just wanted to split on me. I think I got away with it. Let me just clean around here. And all the time I'm um, working the sole as well. And just take a little bit off there. That's where the bark was. Just take a bit off there. You don't have to be this anal about it, but um, it helps. So I've got this. I'll look at that and go, well, okay, take a little bit off there. Completely disagree with what I just said. Um, that's, that's okay. So uh, normally you'd um, do this in a pair. Uh, I was taught to do one and then the other, but that's complete rubbish. You, you, you do it in a pair and then you, you don't have to go back and alter one to fit the other. And we look at these curves and go, okay, that's, that's okay. That's pretty good. So the next thing is the gripper bit. This, this is the V blade or gripper bit. If you look, it's really quite a weird profile on the, on the blade. It's, it's not 90 degrees but you want it to cut 90 degrees. So don't ask me the mathematical formula because I can't work it out. It basically, it's narrower, but it's angled. Now, you can cut in a straight line a, a 90 degree bend. It's dead easy to do. When you go around a corner, one of two things happens. Either the wood breaks or the blade does. Quite often it's the blade, which is quite surprising. And the reason is because everything is engaging at the same time. So you can't turn corners with it. With this, when you cut it, do you see, just the center section engages first and then as you go in fuller, the other bits, this means that you can actually go around corners with it. This knife broke, I managed to snap this once. I think there was a fault in it. It wasn't, it wasn't brute force and ignorance. And I, I got it reprofiled by Matt Sears, who's toolmaker down in 
Pembrokeshire at the time. Uh, he's disappeared off the face of the earth. I, I tried to find him, but he's gone. Scott went to America. I don't know what he's doing now. Uh, I just said to him, please just copy the thing. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about reprofiling it. Just, just take it, make it an inch shorter, get rid of the fault and get it back to me, which is what he did. Did a really nice job on it. But that was 15, oh, 14, 15 years ago. So you're going round the corner. And then, that's where that knot is. I'm gonna watch that. Just be careful when I go through it. And when Thomas James did this, he didn't do anything more. So he didn't come back and clean this out. He just did it with his knife. And that was that. You can actually see it on the, his clogs that they wouldn't be, there'd be a slight roughness right here at the point where they met. You're going one with the other. Didn't matter a damn. Then we're just cutting around. You see, I'm moving my hand. This is uh, the safest knife to use. It's pretty impossible to cut yourself with it. It's very possible to cut yourself with the other ones, quite badly, in fact. Um, but it's the trickiest, because I'm doing most of the work with my left hand. Now, I didn't realize I was until I came to teach Garrett and he wondered why he couldn't do it. And I wondered why he couldn't do it, till we found out what I was doing. And then it all became crystal clear. So we just, we got that, we got this. Got a slight problem here, because we're going one way and then we're going the other. So we just try and clean this. Made a little bit deeper, I don't like it, it's a bit shallow there. That's, that's actually perfectly okay to finish. You, you can play around with it, you can do quite a lot with it. You can clean out this, you know, keep fiddling around with it. And you have to these days because people demand a really good finish. In terms of the product, it probably doesn't make a slightest bit of difference. So that's, that's your sole. These last, all the mobs miller I've got, I, I think they're Canadian maple. Um, some people say hornbeam's the best. I know it's like for shoemaking, but all the clog lasts seem to be Canadian maple. Uh, no idea why Canadian maple, why it wasn't sycamore, but um, that's what they preferred. And they must have had really good, good reason for it, or they wouldn't. So anyway, you, you, the standard way of doing this is, this is a straight last. You see, it's not a left or a right. It's a straight. And it's a model number 32560. And it's between a six and an eight. So basically, the English way is you get a nail and you nail it over there. Okay, like, get this right, like so. The leather is actually Indian water buffalo. This isn't, this is cowhide, but traditionally it was Indian water buffalo, black, swayed side out, rolled in a heavy black wax. And you you heat it up with a thing called a half round bottom glazer, which is basically a file, a half round file that's smooth with a handle on each end. And that's heated up over a gas or over a fire. And then it's rolled onto the leather. And as uh, it, it heats the leather up, the hard wax in the leather melts, becomes liquid. Then you can pull it down to shape. So you nail over here, you nail over here, you nail over here. And then the last thing you do is you hammer here to push this down because I show you the last, it's tapered. And as you do that, you get a nice tight line. But Thomas James didn't do that. Thomas James's last didn't have a mark on the underside. So what did he do? He got a piece of thread and he stitched it in and out of here. And then he pulled it like a purse and tightened it up all underneath. 
He then did the same here and here. He got a piece of thread, and as he heated the leather, he pulled it down with thread. So his lasts he used for 40, 50, 60 years, never had a mark underneath them, except just at the heel where you tap. You just tap there to tighten up that line. The English ones use nails, and they're all wrecked. But Thomas James didn't do that. He said he was a very precise man. So as soon as you've got this stitched and you take it off, what you end up with is you end up with a shape, which this hasn't got at the moment. And because you've, you've taken it off and it's all tucked in, you've got a little pronounced toe there that you've made by drawing this in all the way around it. So you take it off the last, you've heated it up, it's set, it's gone cold and set. You then present it to the sole, but you've got a straight. So how do you get a straight onto a curve? You just move this slightly forward. That makes this side fuller and this side shallower. Just a tweak. That's all you have to do. And then you pin them up and the customer comes in and tries them on because they're all made to measure. So you can do all your final stuff with your customer, which of course you can't do by post. But that's, you know, when it's a village trade, people come in and you try and you, you move it around and you ease it. So that's, that's how that's done. And this is a Welsh slipper. It's a very, it's, think of a backless Swedish clog with a very small back, it's basically what it is. You put a clasp over here, um, just a click on clasp, I'll show you some later. Or you can have one side of this longer and have a button. Or some of them were just stitched over, so you'd have this stitched over that and stitched down. But it's not adjustable then. And these were a yard boot. You could go out of the house, come back in and uh, just kick them off at the door and put slippers on. So that was very economical style, most economical style out there, it uses the least amount of materials. And when you cut them, they, there's very little waste from the way the pattern's shaped on, on the hide. It's, it's a good style. I'll show you um, an English clasp. That's pretty much the same thing. There's a clasp. Okay, this is a child's clasp. There were two different um, clasp manufacturers. There was John Watts and there was Horsefields. And they were the two, seemed to be the two manufacturers up north that made clasps. Uh, so this, this is more of a boot. You see, it's, it's much higher and it fits more around the ankle. The, 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 the slipper f fitted more as a shoe from there to there. This fits more around the ankle. Now this is a stitch. Now if I put my finger inside here, there's, there's no thread. And there's no thread on that side either. Now, it could be neater, but it is tough. And basically what you do is you get um, th five or six strands of cotton and you taper them. So you start one there, you start the next one there, next one there, next one there. And then you twist them and you, you rub them in a heavy wax. And they used to have different waxes uh, for different temperatures. So in the winter, they'd use a, a softer wax than they'd use in the summer. Um, when I first started, you could get different, different types of wax. But what you do is you go through at the, the bottom and you, you have a curved needle, right, like a surgeon's needle, and you twist it through and up. But you don't go right through the leather. You go through the edge, so it's quite gory. So say this is the leather. I go through here. I come out here. I go up through here and I come out here. So there's no stitch going through. And I run the thread through, uh, and after I've done the thread, it's spliced onto Russian boar's bristles. It has to be Russian boar's bristles in the old days because that was very cold there, so the bristles were more bristly. Okay, and also Russian boars are a lot bigger than European ones. Uh, so you, it's very much a, as you splice a joint onto a rod how you do it onto the Russian boar's bristle, but you, you twist it and lock it onto the, 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 the boar's bristle. Then you have a piece of thread with bristle each end. And what you do is you, you start off and you run one through, and then you make another hole just further up, uh, and you go through again, but this time you put the br bristles opposite each other. So they go th run through the hole. So you push them in, then catch them, pull them, make another hole, go up, then you get to the top, you come back down one or two and nip off. Now, because this wax is so heavy, it's got so much friction, it never comes loose. 
So you just come down one or two threads and lock off. Now, by the force of pushing that thread together, you've actually raised this because it's under tension. So that then hides the join. So it's a great stitch. Unfortunately, when it breaks, if it breaks, you can't fix it uh, because you've sent them off to the other side of the, of the country. So it's not quite so good for um, stuff by post. So I don't use this. I use a synthetic thread and do a much cruder stitch. But because the thread is less uh, likely to abrade, it lasts really well. But this is the old fashioned stitch and this is probably about the only, I've only done one or two pairs with this. And, and that's how it meant. That's a traditional clog. It's got brass nails. Soles are actually too thick really. Um, there's your irons, okay? Now this particular type of iron has little tags and you bend those over so that you can't catch it on the ground and, and pull them off. So you, you have lots of different types of iron and you can match up your heels with, with your iron so that you can, you can make them. These don't fit actually, they should be pretty much the same curve as that. The front's a little bit better. That's a common round. Your nails are pretty much the same as a horseshoe nail. It's pretty much exactly the same thing. It's a wedge. It's a slightly, if you look at it from above, it looks like a matchbox, and then it tapers down on four sides. And you, you bend them slightly curved and you flatten the edges. And when you put them in, they, they, they turn and lock. That's the idea. Now, normally you're told never to put a sharp nail into wood because a sharp nail will, will make um, a crack in wood. You're supposed to put a blunt nail into wood and it bruises its way through. You don't do that with these. You get the nail and you hit it on an anvil, each one, the end, and you get the end like a knife point and it cuts its way in. And don't ask me why, because it cuts its way in, it doesn't split. I showed you a bit about the upper. Once you've got the uppers on, uh, you put a, a thing called a, a welt strip. That's the welt strip. The welt in shoes is a joint between the upper and the sole. So you get the welt stitch um, or false welt is what most shoes these days have. They have a join which looks like it's stitched, but it's actually glued on just to, to, to cover the join. But this is, that's the welt strip. And on these, I've just chamfered this. I always chamfer this. It's uh, something I do. Or the clog makers don't. So, just to make it a bit neater and to make them look a bit lighter, you do this and that. Okay? And what you're taking a bit of weight out, which is pathetic, a small amount, but there is one good reason to do it is that if this catches, it's less likely to split the wood. So, because you just put a, a chamfer on it there, it seems to be more resistant to, to splitting a chunk off. So that's basically one sole, it should be a pair. Um, I, once I've made the upper, I tend to just buff off the edge. But you can, what you can do is, you work out how thick your leather is, and then you put a piece of the leather on here with a pencil, and you mark it round, and then you put a chamfer. This is how they did it in Spain. You put a chamfer, 45 degree chamfer round it. You cut it back to about the right thickness, but you put a little chamfer on it and then it covers, it doesn't look bad when you've got it slightly sticking out because it's on an angle. And the other thing is you've made the wood slightly proud of the leather and that protects the leather joint. I tend to make them flush. Uh, which is fine, but they, they tended to make them slightly proud. What you don't want is them to be, the leather to be prouder than the wood, further out than the wood, which modern machine soles nearly always are because they, they're uniform thickness all the way around. And of course, in here, you have a heel counter quite often, a piece of leather to stiffen up the heel and reinforce it. That makes the whole thing fuller here. So if you use you, you tend to find that they, they overlap at the back. It's very bad for a dancing clog because when you click the two together, you catch the nails. These are um, various clasps and buttons. Uh, they're called black japanned, 
Japan was a type of enamelling. Uh, I have been told by a metal worker exactly what it involves. Um, but this is fake Japaning. It was necessarily... It's, it's a black enamel. Uh, Japaning itself was a specific way of treating metal. But basically, it's black enamel on steel. That is a male. And that is a female. Not the same size. This is very slightly smaller than this one. But they fit together like that. And because you've got three slots, you can take up the adjustment. Now... When they finally invented eyelets on boots, the clasp uh, trade tried to have uh, but, uh, eyelets banned because it basically meant that these weren't nearly as good an idea because you can get much more adjustment with an eyelet. The problem was with an eyelet was that they always used to tear and pull. But when they invented metal eyelets to go in the holes, uh, these lost their advantage. And the other thing about these is that you've only got an adjustment over the arch, and it's quite a narrow adjustment. So you can't, for made to measure, it's not such a problem. But if you're making to sell, uh, you can't cover such a wide variety of sizes with the styles that fit this. Now, these are smaller child's female ones. There's a little one there, and a small one there. So they're not always the same shape. Sometimes they're rather nice, sometimes they're square. That tends to be more or less the smallest, and that's about two sizes from the biggest. But these, these are buttons. Uh, they were for, you could use them on a Welsh slipper, you could use them on a, a one or two piece button boot, basically a sandal, and they're instead of buckles. And they're two piece. You only have one of them on each shoe, so you don't have them clipping together. You have a hole in the strap, or several holes in the strap, and you have this little bollard, which is this little bollard which is slightly chamfered, so it tends to hold the leather. The leather doesn't come off it. Now, the reason they're offset is you can have a Sam Brown stud, which is basically a bollard with a nail going through the bottom of it. You put it on the leather, you put a lot of strain on it, it goes sideways, it bends, and the strap tends to come off it. But because this bollard is offset from the clip, this can't bend without this coming up, and this is being pulled that way, and it doesn't want to come up. So that's why they've got this shape. Now this particular one is shaped in sort of oak leaf shape. And there's very, I've got about four different boxes, and they've all got different, sh different um, shapes on them, and they're different lengths. So if you did only have a small number of holes or only one hole in the strap and you wanted to take up the stretch, you could put a shorter one on to get them tight again. But I didn't have these for years. I used to make um, lots and lots of button sandals, clog sandals, and then I ran out. And I didn't have them for about seven or eight years. And then I managed to, to get hold of four boxes from an old supplier up north. And I think I've sold two pairs ever since. Well, I used to be quite good looking when I was younger and I used to sell to lots of girls. And uh, now I'm old and ugly, I tend to sell to lots of blokes. And I think that's got more to do with it than anything else, actually. This is an un undyed piece of leather. It's a heavily oiled leather, um, so it's waterproof. As it comes out of the tannery, and I get it from Joseph Clayton's uh, at Chesterfield, straight from the tannery. It's just pinned. So I've pulled this over with lasting pincers and I've formed it. I haven't heated it up because this is cow hard. It hasn't got any wax in it. It's got a lot of oil in it, but no wax in it. And then I've pulled it down with pincers and I've nailed it, pinned it up. Now, what's going to happen is that I'm going to try them on, on the lady that's getting them. And then if they need moving anywhere, I can ease this up slightly or I can take, make it a bit shallower. So I've left this at this point. Um, just to, you know before I finish them. Now this is a ankle strap and basically they used to go like that. So they go around the ankle, not like that, more like that. And one of the buttons I just showed you would go underneath and then that would have a hole in the strap and that's how it would hold. The pattern for it isn't quite the same as this but this is the only traditional one I've got in, I don't know, it's tin, it's some sort of metal. 
and this is a child's eight and this is slightly gothic if you look at it um, but there it is you can see how this comes out there this is the join at the back this comes up and, and stitches together and the whole pattern comes out of that uh, this is uh, a one piece like the ones I used to make stitch up the back one strap that strap goes over a button the Japan buttons that's there so that works like that and then this is a clasp so this is a front which is uh, number 10 it isn't the size 10 I've never quite worked out how they correlate they tend to be two or three sizes bigger factories would make them and send them to clog makers who would buy them it would be part of the kit so you'd have your your, your patterns you'd buy that in so you'd have your your leather patterns your knives your bench your took a cam a uh, couple uh, lasting pincers uh, half round bottom glazer not a lot of tools you never needed a lot of tools you didn't need many tools and a few lasts uh, if you had straight lasts you could get away with say three sizes to a last this one is just pinned up and this is one that fits on like that so this has got the welt strip on it it's alder I've tapered the toe, I've put a rubber sole on, i put very little tiny tingles just to hold the leather in place so I don't entirely trust the glue. And this has, has a three nail outer toe tin in brass. This one is a different style, it's a more rounded toe, it's going to have a buckle or a button to hold it down there, that's how it's going to fit. It's pretty much finished, it only needs the button to go on and me to take the last out. This has got an inner so this has got uh, a toe tin that just sits on the ledge, whereas this one goes around the outside. I tend to prefer these, but these are more delicate. These look more delicate. But these protect the wood, uh, whereas this just protects the leather and can be a point of weakness. So you have to put very light nails in because you don't want to just sort of make the wood like a piece of uh, toilet paper that has so many holes in it, it's gonna break off. So I don't use these very often. And I've got probably, as a result, I've got enough totins, traditional totins left to see me out. Whereas these ones I have to have made up now. I've run out of that style. All, all the pairs I make are made to measure. I don't make standards. She wanted alder, so she's got an alder sole. And she wanted this totin, she wanted it in blue. She wanted it with steel nails. I've got smaller nails here. A lot of clog makers use the same size nail the way around, but I don't. They're not supposed to do that. You don't need a heavy nail at the toe. There's very little stress on it. So you put a, a, a smaller nail. This one happens to have um, it's a smaller head. But then I've got, say, these are maybe half inch, three eighths. Then you're talking about half inch, uh, five eighths. And then I've got seven eighths around the back. That's the vamp in clog term, if I got this right. And these are the quarters. So the front's called the vamp and the rear is called the quarters. No idea why. Uh, so I'm using um, a standard clasp front um, with actually uh, one of my shoe upper uh, patterns. This is what when I used to make shoes a lot uh, and one or two people wanted their clogs like this. So I've got a strap over and a bolt. Now the interesting thing about this is you can't see it. Inside here, this is level right through to here. So her toe stops about there. And she can't easily, without pain, bend her foot. So what I've done is I've taken the curve out and she's got a flat platform inside to put her foot on and she can still uh, walk in these quite naturally because they've got a roll in them. Uh, obviously, if she can't bend her foot easily, it's not particularly painless for her to walk. So we're hoping that she'll be able to walk pain-free in these. It's not very easy to walk without a big toe, but with a clog, the, the, you're not walking off your toe, you're just rolling along. So if you've got problems such as that, you can deal with that with a clog. People with a foot problem that needed support, we've worked off a plaster cast and carved the sole in the curve of the plaster cast. Actually, I've made two soles. I've made um, a sole to put the last on to, to match, to stretch the upper, then I've taken it off that and put it onto the sole that her foot's going to go on. Um, that worked fine. Um, 
uh, the last one I did, I hadn't heard from her for two years, and then she suddenly popped up and said they needed resoling. And I said, oh, they worked. And she went, oh, yeah, they're great. So that was good. So there's various things that you can do. Um, they don't have to be clogs. You could do some of the stuff with shoes, but if people have difficulty bending their feet but they want a natural walking gait, you can get round that with clogs.